Hi, this is Russ, and welcome to Session 2 in the Freedom Encounters course. How you doing? God bless you. Good to, uh, good to have you here just uh, studying and applying. May God reach into your life, build your life in such a way that great things are going to come through. And those great things um, are the things that Jesus did and wants to do through your life. So I just want to encourage you that as you are beginning to even uh, take the first couple sessions... Uh, ask God for divine appointments. You know, I'm not sure, you know, maybe some of you are in direct ministry, counseling ministry, pastoral ministry, youth ministry. Uh, all of us as believers are called to bear fruit. All of us, uh, we're told in Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Hey, listen, even admonishing, no theto, confronting face to face, even that's a part of free encounter. Man, I would rather go to a brother or sister in Christ that uh, if they're messing up, that I might have to encounter them, not in front of everybody else, but go to them and speak to them boldly and tell them what they need to get out of. Um, that might need to occur and, and to literally help pull them out of it. James, uh, the last verse, talks about you know plucking some people you know, from their sins to, to cover a multitude of sins, to turn them back. And uh, so sometimes we've got to minister boldly and very strong to some, snatching some from the fire, it says in Jude. Or in Galatians chapter 1, where it talks about you who are spiritual, go to restore somebody who's gotten to a sin. They're trapped in a particular uh, sin, a bondage. And uh, you're to go to restore them and do it gently and also watch out. Uh, that you won't be tempted into the same uh, ugly things they've been tempted and brought into. Nobody likes to be in the depths of sin. I mean, um, you know, there's always pain involved. Uh, I've never met a, a really a happy demonized person anywhere along the way. Though there's been some that wanted their demons for power and thought um, that the powers that they've experienced would be, uh, that, that, that that's that's all they've known, though. Once they had a glimpse of the light of Christ, the power of God, once they saw that the demons feared the living Christ, uh, they were astounded, and uh, they wanted to know uh, the other side. They wanted to know the power of God. And not only did they get to know the power of God, but the love of God and the relationship, again, with the greatest relational being, infinite, immeasurable, yet revealed in such personal ways that we cry out, Abba, Father. And that's what we cry out right now. Father, we just pray right now that all of us involved in just learning from you and receiving from you can glorify Christ with our lives, glorify Christ in the ministry that we pour out. Uh, we just pray for wisdom. We pray for um, even new levels of being able to minister. If we only know a few things, God will use the few things. But if you give us more, we'll do even more. And we know that you'll do that because you've promised in John's Gospel, chapter 15, that you've chosen us not only to bear fruit, but if we begin to bear fruit, Father, you you yourself will prune us, sharpen us. You'll make us even better, that we'll be able to do better and more. And uh, so I just pray that for all of us, um, you're going to grant to us that increasing uh, level of uh, ministry uh, to others in Jesus, uh, so seeing their lives set free. Well, listen, we are in session two, page four in the notes, if you've downloaded those. Um, and I want to encourage you to, to do that. So I hope that you have been uh, reading some of the scriptures from last time, Psalm 119. Uh, the book of Acts is a good book, but uh, Mark's gospel. And also um, we mentioned some of the others. And we will do that here as far as Second uh, Corinthians chapter 1. Well, on page four in the beginning, we have these words, free of encounters for all people. Now, that, that could be a sign you can hang out in front of your office door. And uh, I believe that that's what God uh, has come to do. I see Jesus coming in the Gospels. He is freeing people. He is ministering to people, whether it's the woman at the you know caught in adultery, whether it's the man who can't even get up and walk, whether it's the demonized guy in chapter uh, 5. It could be uh, so many different um, individuals. And he ministered to all of them, to all kinds of uh, issues and problems. There wasn't nothing that he could not engage and redeem and bring life to. Jesus is the life giver. Zoe, the qualitative life that comes out of heaven. 
So freedom comes for all people, but listen, there are different types and conditions. I saw in the news tonight in our area where a young boy about a month or so ago um, was even even had a, a restraining order, but he he was so angry at his girlfriend he got out of out of this little workhouse thing or jail or whatever he was in, and he took a shotgun and he went to her and shot her in the face, and she's just a teenager, pretty girl. They showed tonight uh, the pretty face of this girl from her picture, of course. They were showing these doctors were showing her, um, holding up a you know a plastic skull and telling how they're going to have to reconstruct this and redo this and um, she's going to go through numerous surgeries and numerous things to um, to um, to restore her face and her mouth her jaw her nose um, wow what a what a tragedy what a tragedy. So when I'm talking about some people, you know, have lost a job and they feel tragic about that and they're fearful about that and they, they need to know what to do about that. But there are others who have lost so much more. So there are types and conditions. And let me say this right now, whatever you don't have to minister to an individual, listen, just run back to the Lord Jesus, the source. Just go back to him. Sometimes we might have to take time to pray for individuals. You know how it is with many individuals that come to our offices or that we meet, that not everything is done right away. We might only be in the beginning of listening and discerning and diagnosis or in confronting issues. Some people might not be willing to allow you to go to certain areas or be willing to listen to what God says right away. So types and conditions is an issue, but the overall principle is this. God I believe in Christ wants to bring his freedom to all. Jesus said the thief came to kill, steal, and destroy, and he's doing that. That's why psych wards are packed. That's why jails are packed. That's why people are, are seeking every kind of medication. That's why people are doing drugs and alcohol, sex in it up, and everything else. Because um, of uh, the entanglements and the issues of life. But he's, he's come to bring freedom. And he's come to set captives free. We've seen that in the first session. So point number two here on this page four, salvation and changing the core of life. Now Titus chapter 3 verse 5, Romans 6, Romans 8, all of that teaches us so much about the depths of the salvation. Uh, how could we ever ignore so great a salvation, it says in the book of Hebrews. So listen, getting saved is not just saying Jesus come into my life and that's it. Getting saved is inviting the living Christ who once was uh, dead, rose from the dead. Uh, he was the substitute for you. And that he's literally coming to live in your life, giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's total forgiveness, total freedom from the power of sin. Not saying you're not going to sin, but there is at least freedom, uh, at the core level, the foundation. And there's a new nature planted into us. I believe truthfully that even our dna has been affected i believe that our human body has been so affected by salvation by the coming of christ by the new nature that we have everything we need for zoe this christ-like life and eusebia devotion to god well where do i get that well take a look at second peter chapter one Take a look at verse 3. His divine power, perfect tense in the Greek, has given to us everything we need for Zoe, that qualitative Christ-like life uh, that he pours out of himself. We got everything we need to live that life. And then it says, uh, everything we need for life and godliness. Or literally, that word can, re can be translated, a devotion to God. Uh, and I, I know that believers want to be devoted to God and people want to live for God and yet believers get into sins, they get caught into things, they have pain in their life, they got issues in their life. But I'm going to say again that salvation brings everything. Salvation has everything included. It even includes glorification. It includes when we will be made immortal. And the Spirit of God dwelling in you right now is the guarantee of that. Ephesians chapter 1, you can read about it there. But this dynamic salvation is the core change of your life. And the, the person who's going to come to Christ or the person who is in Christ that has difficulties and troubles, yes, God wants to minister to them so that the fullness, the experience of, and the depths of the salvation can be uh, experienced and lived out to the glory of God and to the good 
of the individual. It's great to be saved. And so take time to worship. Take time to have great joy and exalt in the Lord. And uh, as we're told in Ephesians 6, to put on the helmet of salvation, you know what that really means? I, I really believe that not only means protecting your mind from you know the lies of the enemy, but I, I really think it refers to the fullness of all of the aspects of salvation. You're not just forgiven, although that is enormous, because you, you could never forgive yourself. But you're freed by the power of God. The implantation of a new nature. You are now uh, justified before God, made righteous in Christ. So many things that are involved in this. So please, in all of the ministering you're doing, so many Christians have come to me over the years. 30 years I've been in pastoral ministry. 28 as a senior pastor, 2 years as a uh, youth pastor. And let me tell you this, out of the thousands of individuals, let me tell you something. Probably more than half of all Christians who've come to me have come to me uh, because of lack of discipleship and the appropriation of the depths of their, of their salvation and all that it means. And so it's very important that you understand this, uh, that uh, so many believers need to get so deep in the Lord and grow so deep in the Lord so that they can have the depths of that salvation effectual and operative in their life. And that's why we're told and reminded again and again and again and again. So, take a look at point three. We're now going to deal not only with the freedom that Jesus comes to bring for all people, as we've seen prophesied out of Isaiah and in Luke chapter 4, and the salvation, which is the core and the center of all of it, but affects the core of our very being, but deliverance is included. The idea of deliverance from demons I'm referring to now. That we are to be set free from the reign of the demonic. And for you and I to have a grasp of the satanic, it all began in the heavenly. Satan, of course, uh, the, the anointed cherub, you know, rebelled in wickedness. This violent turning occurred. Rebellion against God. And he led a third of the angels away. And so on the face of the earth, in the fall of humanity, um, did you realize something? Sin never occurred in the human race until Satan brought the, the challenge and temptation for that encounter. Sin and Satan are inseparable. I think that's also a very clear in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, that the ruler of the power of the air is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He's operative in the flesh nature. The flesh nature is like his nature. The sarx, the sin nature, is like the nature of Satan. The new nature, of course, is the nature of God in, in Christ. Well, here's a few things. As Jesus comes, he comes to set us free from the ownership that Satan has over our lives. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, we are told that we've been translated from the uh, dominion of Satan... Uh, that darkness, that dominion, that rule and reign, that, that authority that he had. And we've been transferred in Christ into the kingdom, Basileia, the rule of God in, in, in the Son he loves. And so there's been an exchange at salvation. But please understand something. Even Jesus said uh, to the religious Pharisees, uh, when they were trying to claim Abraham as their father and all this historical and national stuff, Jesus was very clear in John 5 and 6 to tell them that, uh, that, that God is not your father, that your father is Satan, your father is the devil. And he's, being, he's giving reference to ownership. See, right now my father is God, uh, and his seal of ownership is on me. And I have been delivered from the ownership of Satan. He has no rights now in Christ over my life. And uh, I may open up things to him. I may have uh, spiritual warfare. I may have attacks and things like that. Now, he does do that. The Bible teaches us that we're not to be unaware of his schemes. Second Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 5 tells us very clearly in 7 and 8 that we're to be alert that our enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We are told very clearly that if we want to express and manifest the mighty power of God, Ephesians six ten on down, that we are to put on the full armor of God, imperative in the Greek, and leave it on. You don't need to put it on every day unless you take it off. Put on the full armor of God, truth, righteousness, salvation, readiness, you know, all the full armor of God to have it on. Um, so, 
Jesus comes into our lives and releases us from the ownership of Satan and releases us from the uh, the workings and now we have a new ownership and that is in Christ and uh, this is the glorious this is the only way to be set free now the issue is that believers have four and I'll go over these in more detail in one session alone just on deliverance one whole hour just on this but let me do the overview now because you might have already been experiencing or dealing with people like this one is oppression the idea that you get the feeling, the cloud, people explain it like, I just feel something over me. I feel like this. Uh, I feel, don't feel like God loves me. I, you know, they're, sp- they're, they're expressing it in their feelings. When Satan comes to um, lie to them through involuntary feelings, and the, they're beginning to express their feelings, I don't know where these feelings are coming from. I don't know where it's coming from. Well, they can feel it. Just like if you're in the cold and you weren't, you know, you get up to, next to something that's warm, you can feel the, the 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 radiation, the heat coming to you. You can feel the heat. And as a believer, if you understand what oppression is, you can feel it. You can feel it in the air. And uh, knowing your authority in Christ and uh, knowing how you can, re, you know, resist the devil that he might flee from you, James chapter 4, you can also uh, use the authority of Christ, Luke 1017 to rebuke that oppression and renounce if you can discern that oppression is here uh, then you need to respond so many times people come in Christians come in and they say man the devil's doing this I think the devil's beating me up and they'll explain what the devil's doing and they're all beat up and they haven't done anything they don't do anything in response and it's very clear they have not been taught and trained in basic spiritual warfare let alone anything deeper so it's very important because I know of uh, Christian counselors and even pastors who do who who really know nothing of spiritual warfare, of oppression, attack, attachment, or demonization. They avoid it. In our little tiny offices here in this area, with very little, you know, we don't advertise anything. Um, we just lately have started websites and things like that because we want to reach out to more folks. But in our own town. We've had individuals from up to 50 separate churches brought to us for deliverance and freedom from demonic presence. Now, it's, you know, for us, deliverance comes in Christ. It's demonstrated. But Jesus said, you know, I have given you authority. Perfect tense. From the moment of salvation to right now in your life, you have the abiding result of, of, uh, of authority. And it's <laughs> what's the authority for? The authority of Jesus Christ, the very authority that God gives you, is to do what? To trample on the demonic realm. Then it says to overcome Nike with a decisive victory, to win, to have victory over all the power of the enemy. Then Jesus said, and nothing will harm you. Too many Christians living in fear. Too many Christians afraid to deal with this. And that's why people constantly send people to us all the time. And I tell pastors... I told an associate pastor of a 10,000-member church, I don't want any more of your people. I want you to do this. And because of that guy's theological persuasion, um, he said that we can't do deliverance here. We, we It would split our church. We can't do this kind of stuff here. And it's very sad because what, what he was saying was, we can't do this aspect of the ministry of Jesus. We can't. You know, we might have 10,000 people and maybe a few thousand of them have either oppression or attack and they don't know what's going on in their life. We can't help them because, uh, well, our theological position, you know what? You need to repent of the theological position because it's not based on the Word of God, not on the ministry of Jesus. Jesus says to every Christian, and we need to appropriate this, I appropriate, I accept by faith the authority Christ has given me. And I will exercise that authority in one way, authoritative oral prayer to rebuke the demonic to order the spirits to command them in the name of the Lord Jesus because he's given us authority and that's very important because in pressure you know in oppression you know when I ever when I'm going through the Lord's prayer my daily prayer time you know I I worship first I intercede second I pray about my own needs thirdly I ask the Lord if there's any sin issues or whatever else I say keep me from all temptation and then when I get to the part that says it delivers from the evil one Excuse me. I that's where I will unleash warfare. I will ask the Lord, is there anything coming against me personally? You know, I want to be free. I want to know what the enemy's doing. Jesus gave a heads up to the early disciples. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. 
Now, when, he, when Jesus said that to the brand new believers there, they had no idea what was going to happen. That's why they get so beat up. And uh, once they begin to know what happens, and they know their authority, and they're filled with the Spirit of God, then you have Peter in Acts chapter uh, 5, when Satan himself tries to enter in through Ananias and Sapphira, he's able to turn around and stand there boldly. He's there going to be operating in the presence and power of God, and he's not going to let this demonic attack. He he's not fearful. He's not afraid with Satan himself entering into people. But now with the Spirit of God and with some maturity in his life, he knows what to do. And as we grow, we'll know more and more what to do. You'll feel bolder and stronger, and that's a very good thing. Very good thing. Because fear uh, gives way to the enemy anyway. And, it, and, and fear suppresses faith. God operates through the window of faith. And we need to have our faith, the shield of faith, lifted all the way so we can extinguish all the flaming darts of the uh, evil one. Correct? Ephesians chapter 6. Well, let me just uh, <clears throat> mention here also uh, the issue of oppression. Then I mentioned attack. Ephesians 6, the day of evil. I refer to that as the attack. Like Job, it wasn't just one thing. It was many things. You know, and again, just being a believer, you can get oppression and you can get attack. Not because you've done anything wrong. But Satan is out to devour. He's out to attack. He's out to bring havoc. And so we are told if we want to manifest, live in, and manifest the mighty power, strength of God, then we've got to have the full armor of God on, and we'll be able to take our stand. And uh, we'll be completely uh, defended and covered, and yet also have the ability to attack. Well, then that's all about the enemy attacking us. When he attacks us in our circumstances, in our thought life, uh, when he attacks us through other people. Now listen, here's something I'm going to say now, I'll say later. Sometimes the enemy piggybacks other people who are acting out of the flesh, who are into sin, into bitterness, into anger, and he slides in off of their anger to speak an attack against you, to bring an attitude against you. Do you ever have it where somebody's really attacked you, said something against you, whatever else, then later they don't even remember saying it? They, they, they deny even that they ever said it or whatever? Or they don't know what over, you know, I don't know what, over, I don't know what came over me. Well, if they were in the sin, if they were in the flesh, if they were in anger, it's very possible for the enemy to piggyback that and attack you or attack another believer. So attack occurs. And uh, we're told, and even in uh, James chapter 4, we're told very clearly to submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, wash your hands from any sin, um, purify your mind from any you know, double-mindedness, doubt, we're told to do, to resist the devil and he will flee. So attack is not something you should be completely fearful of and realize that it comes from time to time. But also you're going to have to respond back and the stronger the attack against you, the stronger your response in prayer, speaking out an authority to renounce. If you get an insight from the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of God on what attack is coming against you, then you should unleash uh, spiritual warfare prayers, authority, maybe even asking others to pray in specific, focused ways against the very attack the enemy is bringing. And we're going to need to do that. We're going to need to do that in helping others. People come in sometimes, and as we're praying, we eventually discern. You know what this is? This is an attack against of the enemy against your life. This is the enemy attacking your life. If you could discern that, well, then what do we do? Well, one of the things you do: make sure you have the full armor of God on. Another thing you're going to do is you're going to be able to resist the devil. Another thing you do is orally speak out and pray and come against um, <clears throat> the direct attack that's coming against you. Well, oppression attack can come. I'll explain these in great detail later on. But let me mention here now too, attachment and demonization, D&E. Attachment, Ephesians 4.26. Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down in your anger and give the devil a foothold, a topon. It's a legal right, but it is a doorway. So that if you or any believer, anybody that's a, even a believer, because I've heard before, well, believers can't have demons. Well, not in the sense of the ownership, the way possession is, is done in a non-Christian. But in the sense that a Christian opens up to sin, the Word of God says it gives the devil a topon, a way of attachment to that area of flesh. If you're into some deep, unrepentant anger or lust or bitterness... 
Uh, if you have gone out as a believer and for some reason stupidly went to a uh, psychic and wanted a reading done, it's very possible that through those uh, willful open doors in your own life, you've allowed the enemy to uh, attach uh, to that specific er unrepented of area. And you're going to have to lead people to uh, areas of repentance. And listen, and I know when you're going through this, it may be that God reveals things to you. Some people say, what about bloodlines? I'll, I'll refer to that later on, too. Uh, what about the past and whatever else? Here's, this is simple. Here's how simple it is really right now. Get, if you're a believer, to get before the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, you know, reveal to me, search me. You know, Psalm 139, search me. See, see if there's any offensive thing. See if there's any, is there anything demonic attached to me? And uh, you can uh, repent of the flesh and uh, also renounce the demonic and find freedom in Christ. Some have called this auto-deliverance for believers. Because it's not the same thing as a total takeover. And that's the fourth area that we'll talk about uh, both here and in, in detail later. Demonization. Diamonozoid, the Greek word. Um, that we really see, Mark chapter 5 is, uh, is uh, one of the worst cases in the scriptures we see. We also see in the book of Acts, when Paul is coming to a town to preach, there's a young lady following them around. She has a python. That's the Greek word for the, the demon, the spirit. She has a, uh, a powerful spirit that enabled her with abilities, psychic abilities or whatever, to read the future. And they were making money. People were making money off her. It was spiritual prostitution. They were using the woman to make money off of her, just like a, uh, they do it with prostitution. And uh, notice that Paul was agitated. That's a good word. I find this is true, that I get agitated in the sense uh, uh, where there's demonic presence like that manifesting, where they're speaking through. She was walking around speaking through, probably mocking, um, mocking. These are servants of the Most High God, you know, mocking or whatever. And uh, um, the demon is, it wasn't there to help them, wasn't there to bless them. It was there to mock them and to be an interference. So... Having the Spirit of God in you causes a sense of... I've seen it where, where individuals walk into the very, to my office and I'll begin to talk with them and begin inwardly to feel that spiritual agitation because the Spirit of God in me and the demons in them, there is, there, there's two opposing... What does the temple of God have to do with the temple of Belial? Nothing. And uh, so there's always going to be that sense of complete and total warfare. And in, in, in demonization, the young lady, Paul turned around with that agitation and finally commanded to leave. He ordered it what to do, and it did. He didn't do any kind of weird stuff. He didn't slam their heads, you know, uh, with stuff. He didn't have to throw a gallon of oil on them. Uh, he didn't have to make a major production out of it. He just did it. Matter of fact, in the New Testament, you can check this out, Jesus and the disciples never asked a manifest a, a person who's been demonized that manifest a mind. They never ask, "Do you want to get rid of this?" They never said to them, "Do you want to get saved first? No, they pointedly got rid of the demonic, and normally uh, then the person uh, in that power encounter turns to Christ. And that's how we've seen it. There's been only a few cases where cult multiples, which we'll explain later, uh, didn't want to give up all the powers and wanted to go back to the coven and uh, be an elitist, a Luciferian. Well, let me mention now also that in the uh, deliverance issue, and I've already mentioned uh, freedom encounters, salvation and changing the core of life, deliverance comes right along with that. Uh, in the issues of SRA, MPD, DID, MC, now let me mention those again and I'll detail those on the next page. Uh, satanic ritual abuse, multiple personality disorder, dissociative identity disorder, and mind control. I like to call it modern mind control because it's quite different from the old forms. Well, there's a complexity. There's a complexity because you're not dealing, you're dealing with somebody, anybody who has multiple personalities inside, anybody who's been split and, uh, and cut up per se, they have um, clearly uh, a greater need of the grace and mercy and workings of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus because uh, of greater things that were done to them. Now, my personal view, and I'll say this again later, is that uh, the splitting of a human uh, personality for the purposeful creation of, uh, of, of other sub-personalities is a, a demonic technology. 
uh, that has been uh, passed along. And there is purpose and uh, design behind it uh, for that side of things. But ultimately, when someone who has this comes to you, there's a complexity there because you're not dealing with one individual. It's almost like an entire family of 15 people walked into the room. And though the father is speaking, everybody else has their own difficulties. So you've got to get to the father and got to get the rest. So in a multiple like this, you're dealing with a host person and a whole bunch of sub-personalities with different ages, different uh, experiences, different memories. The host person may not have any of some of the men men memories of the past. And uh, then you have demonization in some areas uh, of the personalities inside and maybe not in the others. So it's going to be a step-by-step -step procedure. And part of this whole 20-24 uh, hour uh, lecture course uh, in notes and so forth uh, is going to be aimed at dealing with uh, the multiple but anything that's uh, uh, shared in freedom encounters with the multiple will also be able to be used uh, for anybody that's not a multiple and in an easier in an easier way because uh, you're dealing with one single human personality and uh, though a person has many demons uh, Many times I find deliverance is easier than the inner healing and getting sub-personalities to yield and uh, turn and experience an encounter with Christ. So you have complexity here, and it involves untying the knots. Now it brings to my mind right away Isaiah 58, verse 6, about breaking the yoke, but not just the yoke, every yoke. To go break every yoke. And uh, what I've found in all this ministry is Jesus wants to get to all of human personality with inside of a multiple. He wants them all redeemed, healed, gloriously changed, and uh, uh, we just simply call it being healed, where he literally takes them. And uh, they, they, they yield and want to go with him and be protected, and, and a person is freed. But there's so much more to it, which I'm going to go over here in page 6. But let's turn to page 5 because we're already about halfway through session two. Included with this freedom that Jesus brings is salvation as the core issue, the, the foundation of it all. Deliverance, of course, we touched on a few things. But then fourthly, there is uh, the inner healing for the personality, mind and emotion. Why? Well, A, the, the horror and trauma and pain that goes on in life. The rape, uh, the uh, abuse, uh, the beatings, the uh, relationship breakdowns, the divorces, the losing of jobs, health issues, uh, satanic ritual abuse, uh, demonization, uh, all kinds of violence and hatred and prejudice and bitterness and rage and all those things that come into our life, uh, the sin nature that, that complicates and so forth. So there is a lot. That's why I mentioned already that psych wards are packed jails are packed. A lot of people just need a lot of freedom. Some don't even want it. Some of the people that come to your offices, regardless of the pain they're in, they may not want Jesus. They may not believe that he's the answer. And uh, they may want something else. I've had people come to me and I had a biker from uh, a group similar to the Hells Angels. They're called the Outlaws. And one of those outlaws grabbed a hold of me and asked me if I could go help his friend. Because I cared about his friend. We were witnessing to his friend. And he wanted me to go to him, though, but he said this, don't put any religion on him, just help him get out of his problems. <laughs> well, um, that's not how it's going to work. I'm going to proclaim this incredible great news of Jesus, and I want to lead them to salvation. I want to help them with their problems. Now, sometimes you help people with their problems, or you see deliverance, or even healing, and they know it came from the power of God, and that's why so many times they turn so quickly to Jesus then. In a, in a powerful encounter, a freedom encounter. You're also going to deal with individuals' lives. You know, for inner healing, you're going to deal with the past. The past is affecting the present. Now listen, if, if the past is affecting the present, um, it's also going to affect the future. The past is some issue in childhood, some uh, something that happened when you were a teenager, some kind of uh, you know relationship issue that occurred when you were 19, and maybe uh, you're 39 years old now, and and uh, you're you're gonna have to look for that past issue. Now we're not dealing with multiplicity here, because in in every multiple there is a multitude of past issues. Every single personality inside of them is a past issue. 
if they were split when they were four, split when they were five, split when they were ten, split 50 other times between then and, and 18 years old, then it tells you that there are 50 episodes of massive trauma, so much so that it split the human personality. But if they also program that personality and then demonize that personality and then trained that personality to be loyal and so forth, and to grow in their abilities, then let me tell you something very clear. Then every single error, that, that's a whole bunch of past issues. And the past issues like that will affect the present. And any past issue that affects the present will affect the future. So if you have an issue or somebody has an issue you're dealing with that has affected them and left them in a fearful stage, then unless that's dealt with, tomorrow and the next day, they're going to have that fearfulness in their life. If some past issue affected bitterness in their life or their response was racism and their present condition is, you know, that they're bitter and that they're angry or that they're racist. Well, unless that's encountered tomorrow, the next day in the future, they're going to have the same problem. So in some people, they come in and they say, man, two days ago, I lost my job. What are we going to do about it? You know, two days ago, my girlfriend left me. OK, we're dealing with something it seems like right now. But a lot of people come in because they know their present life is messed up because of the nagging problems of the past. Well, let's talk about some of those in point C. Under 4C, it says this. We find our... Listen. When we find our own cures, that's also the time we need from Jesus inner healing of mind and emotion too. Here's what occurs. Some people, when they have trouble in the past... Instead of dealing with it, maybe they didn't know how, especially in children. They don't know how to handle things. They don't know how to handle sexual abuse or anything else. They don't know how to handle what occurs to them. Um, what, they, what, they, what they're going through um, is something they have to push off and bury. And that's why I call some uh, past issues beach balls, where you take a beach ball and push it all the way down into the water. And as a kid, I've done this. I've tried to sit on them or whatever. But the bottom line is, unless you continue to hold it, unless you continue to keep it down, guess what? Um, it'll pop right up. It'll pop right up. So it's very important that you and I understand that uh, when individuals come in, they may have in their lives five, six different issues, abuses, problems that occurred that they simply have buried as a beach ball. And um, by the ministry of the Spirit of God, and you're going in to listen to them, to listen to the Spirit of God, to pray for uh, search and rescue, per se, you've got to go find those areas and, uh, and help them to, to allow them to come up. Allow them to come up uh, so that they can be addressed, so that Jesus can bring ministry uh, to their issues that they uh, have pushed down. Now, the other side is toxic ground, what I refer to toxic ground. In other words, it's an area of their life that, you know, if the moment you touch it, 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 it they're going to turn into, you know, pain, uh, anger, whatever else. It's Some people call this pushing buttons. What does that mean? Well, you've, you've touched on an area that really upsets, angers, whatever else. That has to be dealt with. That has to come under the surrender to Jesus and ministry to Jesus. And um, that has to have... Uh, and respond to Jesus. And then there's the aspect I see sometimes where it's like, halt, who goes there? Uh, just don't go there. Uh, someone comes and says, I want to deal with what I'm going through right now is divorce, but don't you go and talk, deal with my dad. Don't you start talking about that. Um, because the truth is that when, they, when someone comes in or you're meeting with somebody, Jesus wants to take them out of the bondage, into the promised land. That's true in every case. Jesus says, Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy. He came to give abundant life. So you better believe that Jesus wants to get to everything. And don't be an incomplete counselor where you just deal with one issue. Don't let the counselee rule and run sessions. Those are some of the basic things we need to learn at the very beginning. Because you're there to bring everything that Jesus wants to bring. So you might have to touch on the, um, the beach balls that hold a lot of the old things that uh, they just didn't want to bring up. You might have to. You might have some really touchy, toxic ground at the moment. I mean, they're just going to get angry. They might rant and rave, um, or again, the idea of just simply the vault is closed, 
and don't you dare go there. I don't want to, you know, out of sight, out of mind. But that's not true. That's not true. It never heals them. If you ignore something like this, it doesn't go away by itself. You know, when we find our own cures, alcohol, pills, other people, food to comfort us. No, people got to not only bring, be, be healed and encountered by the Lord and be instructed by the Lord and ministry occur, because even the demonic can attach to some of these things to make it worse. They are rats that love garbage. And when they smell pain and hurt and bitterness and anger and fear, they love to come and sniff around and bite into it and to make it even worse. So when people seek out their own cures or ignore Nothing goes away. As a matter of fact, it may become worse. Jesus comes to deal and confront and minister to and bring the inner healing and bring the answers and bring the, you know, the release to these areas. It's very important we get to these areas. And we'll go over, we'll have an entire session just on this, maybe even two full sessions just on the inner healing issues and, uh, and how to go through things with them. On page five, number five, it says, it's a, it's a tough word, it's just made up, um, it's, it's not in the dictionary, retruthing. This is the word I've given for that, that exchanging lies for the living truth. So retruthing, again, is, is very important. That um, people have been lied to all of their lives. They've been told one thing and they've lived by that, they've been told by somebody they thought maybe a grandfather said you know hey you know having sex with you my little grandchild you know it's a normal thing and we like to do it it's fun no it's a lie you know what they're saying is a lie and everything about it is a distortion so in so many people's lives there needs to be or someone might come in and say well god hates me and god will never save me god doesn't like me my own father was that way he thought he was too sinful uh that god would never you know you know you know, care to deal with his sinfulness. Well, God did, and my father, at age 70, got saved. Too bad he waited that long. I watched his life and how much misery. So there needs to be retruthing, and and a lot of that comes from speaking the truth. What the Holy Spirit gives you to speak to somebody uh, in charismatic ministry, uh, what God caused you to speak to people. Um, it may be just one Holy Spirit lifted verse, where God, the Holy Spirit gives you one verse. Uh, out of nowhere, it seems like to you, but you speak it into them, and it literally uh, exposes and crushes the lie. But part of what they have to do is exchange. When uh, in the sessions of Freedom Encounter, when we get people to see if there are lies that they're living by, even Christians who are living by little lies here and there, um, it's not about just getting rid of the lie. It's also exchanging it so that truth. When a lie is lodged in a person's life, then the mind and emotions will be affected by that. and There'll be limitations. And so just to get rid of it, it's good, but not good enough. They need then to have the truth. They need to have the truth that has another operative power that brings power and strength and release and uh, literally brings truth. The Greek word halathia in Greek dictionaries is also translated as reality. The idea that biblical truth is reality. God ministering to people and speaking to people is not only reality, it is truth. It is not only truth, it is reality. So what can a lie do? Well, listen, one little sentence of a lie. It can steal joy, steal ministry, steal fruitfulness, steal from a believer their comfort in Christ, steal from the experience in Christ. It can steal that from them forever seeking God and believing God. It can steal faith. Uh, one little lie. I mean, that's what Satan did in the very beginning. First he got Eve uh, to doubt, and then he outright lied. And, uh, of course, when anybody embraces a lie, they embrace the liar that gave it. Let me say that again. Anybody who embraces a lie, and this is very important in spiritual warfare, because Ephesians chapter 6 says that if we lift up the shield of faith, we extinguish all those flaming arrows of the evil one. What are those flaming arrows? Those are those little sentences or feelings that are sent involuntarily through circumstances or directly 
that, that counter the truth of God, that make you feel like God doesn't love you, feel like God will never use you, feel like you'll never be totally forgiven, feel like you can never recover. And those are all lies. So when a person says, you know, and, and they can, you know, really under the, under the guidance of the Spirit of God, you know, recognize that all their life they've listened to, uh, they believed they were never good enough. They were never good enough. It was an underlying principle of their life. When you can get to, and again, it could be many different things when we go through the encounter, as we'll do later on. Uh, matter of fact, one of the sessions will take you through this entire freedom encounter process and, um, and, and cause you to be before the Lord to experience step by step by step, which is a very good thing. I think that's what Psalm 139 is all about. When you read the verse that says, Search me, O God, and see if there's any offensive thing. Well, why can't the Lord search if there's a lie? Why can't the search, Lord search if there's uh, old beach balls of bad things and t toxic ground? Uh, why can't the Lord search for personalities that have been created? Why can't the Lord search uh, for demonic attachment and anything else? Well, He can. And that's the good thing, because the light that shines is also the light that points to the redemption and deliverance and healing that is found in Christ. Uh, and some of that healing is simply uh, engaging truth. And when you engage and embrace truth, you engage and embrace the one who gives it. All truth comes from Jesus. When a person grips the scripture and believes that scripture, then God can operate that truth into their lives. Like it says in Thessalonians. It says, uh, because uh, they talked about, you believe the word of God, uh, not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. See that phrase, wor is at work in a case. It's a word that means has a, a supernatural operative presence and power uh, operating in your life. Um, that's what the word of God does when it's believed. So any scripture you don't believe, directly, truly believe, it's not really operating in your life. And you don't experience the beauty of it. So if you read the scripture that says, when, when in Ephes or Hebrews 13, uh, I will never leave you, never forsake you. You know, in the Greek it has five negatives. So I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Um, and you embrace that truth. That he will never leave me, he'll never forsake me, and you accept that and believe that truth, because it is true. You appropriate that truth. Then you should not have problems with abandonment from God. Now, you might have had abandonment from your own parents or whatever else, and people might have abandonment issues. And uh, we can, you know, through the Lord Jesus, deal with those kind of things. But uh, as far as God abandoning, a person has to embrace the truth and get rid of the lie. they got to get rid of the lie. What can truth do? Truth, listen, truth can, uh, like Jesus said in John 8, set you free. You are truly my disciples, you know, if you keep the word I've spoken to you, uh, and when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Now, the Greek word there, gnosis, um, is the experiential knowledge of truth. You shall know by experience the truth, and that truth will set you free. So it's very important we understand that we've experienced the truth. How? Appropriate it by faith. Put it into action by obedience. It will literally live in you. First John chapter 2, when he says, I write to you young men, because you are strong. You've overcome the evil one. Why? Because the word of God lives. Truth lives in you. God's able to bring a supernatural oper operating work in you based on that verse because you, you've said yes to it. So if you say yes to the lie, the liar is going to operate in you. If you say yes to the truth, uh, the, the one who um, grants and is the truth operates in you. And that's a very big difference. So you're going to have to help uh, both with multiples and every other kind of trauma and issues. Many times there's this issue of retruthing, exchanging lies for the truth. Let's go on to point six, if we would could, and uh, just touch on this real quick, too. Search and rescue in freedom encounters. Now, uh, there's always a reason for pain in people's lives. And uh, though they might be experiencing one area of pain right now, it might be that there are ten other things going on in their life. Uh, there might not be just one beach ball of pain for the past. There may be three beach balls of pain, two toxic areas that if you step on them, they're really going to go wild, and uh, one or two areas they don't even want to go to. 
But here's where we need to do this search and rescue, not only in the conversation, not only the asking of questions, which can be guided by the Spirit of God. There's times I'll be, because uh, when I'm usually dealing with somebody, I'm writing notes at the same time. Sometimes, as I pray ahead of time, and I teach all of these principles uh, in theocentric counseling, another course that we have, and uh, but I, I, I teach in preparation for one of the Freedom Counter Sessions, which you'll get in this course too. But uh, in preparation, I will do I will prayer map a person ahead of time to see everything that God can give me ahead of time uh, before I even meet them, before they even come to the door. And so that's very important. And God may give you many different things. Um, and uh, they may be astounded by, again, God's grace and supernatural ability to, to show things. And, uh, and uh, then that builds faith. And then they know they can uh, come to, to the living Christ for all the issues. Search and Rescues deals with this. Uh, simply uh, praying that God would search uh, that there would be a probing, there would be a looking for, whether that's from a word of knowledge. The Holy Spirit will give you perception. The Holy Spirit will give you sometimes, a, you know, if it's with multiples, a name of another personality. Sometimes in spiritual warfare, uh, uh, the the name of, of a demonic function. Uh, sometimes you're looking at a person, talking with them, and all of a sudden it comes to your mind from the Spirit of God, uh, uh, an uncle that had a knife, and all of a sudden they break down in tears and say, yes, an uncle had a knife to my throat and that's who molested me. And they, wouldn't, they weren't willing to tell you that until God gave you a supernatural breaking into. And the reason he gives you the breaking into is for one reason. To bring healing and ministry and deliverance and freedom and forgiveness of sin to the issues of their lives. Isn't that great? It's an awesome thing. It really is an awesome thing. Well, also, it also deals with uh, breaking through layers in a person's life because many times people have to come back one, you know, two or three or four times if they've got a lot of things to deal with. And uh, sometimes it's because they're not willing to go to certain areas until God breaks through one area and breaks through another area and breaks through another area. Because we're dealing with the human will and multiples, we're dealing with human will. I asked God one time why it takes so long sometimes for some multiples, and he said because he will, you know, he's not going to override their will. He's not going to do to their will what programmers and splitters and coven people and all that uh, people have done to them. Human will is the person. And uh, God uh, empowers the will to believe through the word of God. And he comes to engage the will. He said in John 7, whoever is willing to do my will shall know the teaching. So there is a working of God to move people to willingness. And without that word of God and the work of the Spirit of God, they could even become willing. The good news is that God can break in with his light and his truth and his ministry to uh, empower that will uh, to respond to God and receive. Well, listen, many of these things, again, we are going over in an overview process. Let me ask you real quick, how you doing? Are you spotting some things in your own life? Are you realizing that, that Jesus can get to things and, um, and bring ministry to areas of your life? Listen, one of the sessions will take you through a simple way of going through to a full freedom encounter, and uh, you'll be able to clear some of the air, see some exchange go on, see some impartation from the Lord occur, and uh, find yourself more deeply rooted in Jesus. Um, you know why? Because he wants to take you out of the land of bondage and pain and satanic oppression break you free. He doesn't want you just wandering around in the desert. He wants to bring you to the promised land. And that's not just heaven alone. That's living an abundant life in Christ. That's having victory in Him. That's having the joy of the Lord. Listen, the fruit of the Spirit is what? You know, haggard emotions, uh, bitterness, uh, confusion. No. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Some people just can't even get control of their own issues and sins, and that's why they get into addictions. Well, the Spirit of God gives you self-control. As you yield and obey the Lord, uh, He empowers you. Well, these are good things, and uh, these are things that we will uh, speak again and again throughout the course. But let me mention, with the uh, time we have left in this session, page 6 and 7, um, just something uh, what I call in light of current conditions. Point 1, page 6. The house that pain built. A, universal. Everybody has pain in some level. Everybody's gone through something. Everybody has it in some you know thing. We Some people who've been through so many things might look at somebody else that barely has a scratch on their emotions. 
uh, but some people can't handle a scratch. And uh, so there's a universal issue of pain and issues and problems. Why? Fallen world, Genesis 3, broken in every way, psychologically, ecologically, uh, in every possible way from our spiritual break has come uh, breaks in, 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 in humanity. Uh, and so we are uh, broken as a human race. Even the issue of death, aging and death, is a biblical um, revelation on why we are dying, what death is all about. Some people need counseling. I've done so many funerals. I don't even know how many funerals in, in 30 years. And I find people need ministry. And, and sometimes just right there, sometimes people, some ministry, listen, this is good news. Some counseling sessions only take 10 minutes. Others take, you know, 10 weeks. And uh, I just find that even in the area of death and funerals and things like that, there are people that things come up, you know, their father died or grandfather died and memories, and sometimes they hate them, sometimes they love them, sometimes they want to forgive them, sometimes they want to talk to them. Oh, so many different things. But again, Jesus is there. He can sort things out. He's able to do that. And God can give you some tremendous, tremendous word and ministry to say to grieving individuals. Well, there's extraordinary things, too, like I mentioned about the girl who got her face half shot off, but who's still alive. Or those who've gone through uh, satanic ritual abuse, or raped, or in all kinds of issues, shot, things like that, went uh, through a spouse committing adultery. You know, extraordinary things can go on. Let me also mention the ramping up. I mention this a lot when you hear me say the ramping up. Biblical prophecy teaches us that in the uh, towards the last days, all the way to the day of the Antichrist, the ramping up of demonic presence will be unprecedented. So I mentioned this to somebody else the other day. I said, "Listen, if uh, you know years ago, ten thousand people in America had demons, uh, it's very possible that uh, their ch- children will be affected. But now, if there are five million people that are demonized." Think how many children are affected. So the Bible clearly in prophecy tells us about counterfeit signs, wonders, and miracles. The the demonization of the human race. Read about it in in Revelation chapter 18 where it talks about as uh, as Babylon is built. The the demons are highly manifesting. And so in in our culture, 65 million New Agers, hundreds of thousands of those in Satanism and every kind of other practice, uh, they're going to get demons. They're going to have demons. They're going to be releasing demons. And we're going to need to really unleash the kingdom and the authority uh, and the ministry of Jesus uh, to those who are demonized. Um, think about uh, under D, millions of SRA, satanic, ritually abused people. They have mul- There's Some have estimated 4.5 million diagnosed cases. Some, uh, like myself, believe there's another 4 or 5 million um, that have been undiagnosed. Where did 8, 9, 10 million people with multiple personality come from? Where did they come from? And what can we do? Well, in what can we do, uh, I think session one covers a lot of that, but again, Isaiah 58, study that. Because God wants to not only minister to us, but He wants to turn us into those who can repair broken walls. So Isaiah 58 is a tremendous, tremendous chapter for us to study. I'm going to touch on uh, just an overview real quick of some things, and then we're going to close. Uh, some of the things we're going to have to deal with. Uh, rich, satanic ritual abuse, multiple personality disorder, dissociative identity disorder, modern mind control. When you're dealing with somebody who has SRA, you're going to deal with somebody who has multiple personality disorder. You're going to deal with somebody who has some level of mind control and programming. You're going to deal with somebody who possibly has a coven in the background, in the family members military, rogue military uh, involvement. You're going to need to involve law enforcement where crimes have been, sexual abuse of children and and abuse and things like that. Uh, Many multiples don't realize that their other personalities have been abusing their own children. And that's a tough thing to deal with. Verification of stories and places, the issue of many sub-personalities, personalities who can run, inform, tell, all kinds of things. We'll talk about a whole bunch of them in later. Spiritual warfare. Anybody who's demonized, you've got to be realizing the demons might want to attack you. The issue of threats, protection that you're going to need for the Lord, Psalm 91, uh, to be covered, in a, in, in, but even be smart in, in a physical sense. The time issue involved in ministering, especially to multiples. Boundaries. You know, to where you're not going to be called night and day and and, uh, let everybody overtake you and you set the boundaries and so forth as the Lord gives you. Uh, Institutions you're going to have to deal with where maybe people have been 
um, misdiagnosed where there might be uh, handlers and others. Uh, we'll talk about that in detail. Families who are abusing families you'll have to deal with. Handlers who are controlling multiples and using triggers. All of this is involved in deep level ministry which Freedom Encounters touches. Let me finally say this in the last minute. God wants, um, he wants deeply, deeply experienced uh, uh, servants, deeply uh, grown servants. It's very important for you to realize that. God wants to invest deeply into your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 deals with, uh, you know, again, Paul the Apostle, as a servant of God, talks about, you know, that he despaired even of life. They felt the sentence, the absolute surety that, that death was coming to them. And he despaired. His emotions were really, I mean, they were really, this is the Apostle. So don't be ashamed when you and I as a counselor at times uh, feel these things. I'm not afraid to share out of Psalms where it says, My eyes grow dim with grief. One time Psalm writer says that he's so under depression and oppression that he staggered like a drunk man under those emotions. In every case in the book of Psalms, every case where those who had great pain, trouble, pressure, anger, everything else, when they bring it to Jesus, when they brought it to the Lord, he answered them. He helped them. He visited them. That gives me great hope again. The God of hope will fill me with all joy and peace as I trust in Him so that I might overflow with that divine, indefeatable, uh, real optimism because, because God reaches in. Study the psalm sometimes. I did this in my own emotional pressures that I've been through in life. The times that I felt like I was emotionally bleeding over issues and things that were occurring. Going to the Psalms, I find that they cried out to the Lord. They called out to the Lord. They laid their complaint out. They shared. They brought out. They didn't hold it in. They didn't ignore it. They didn't put it down like a beach ball. They brought it all out before God and cried out to God and brought it before Him. And in every case where they brought it out before God, in every case, He answered, He came, He visited, He arrived, He, he, he dealt with the issues. And that is the good news, my friend. That is the good news for our own lives. That is the good news for those uh, that we're going to be ministering to. But uh, in this uh, very beginning stage, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm sure that some of us might say, you know what, I've got in this class, I'm realizing, I'm realizing how messed up I am. <laughs> That's all right. For every point of, of mess up in your own life, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a corresponding response from the incredible Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an incredible ability of the Spirit of God to operate and work in your life. So I want to encourage you right now to surrender to the Lord. Study over 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice how Paul the Apostle talks about his pain, but he also says God delivered us, and God will continue to deliver us with the help of your prayers. God will deliver you. God will deliver you. The people you're dealing with, He'll deliver them. Let's just cry out to God. Let's make God our refuge. Let's make God our source. Let's make the Lord Jesus all that He is for us. and Receive from Him grace upon grace. You know what one of the lies are that you, have to, you and I have to exchange sometime? That you and I who have been older in the Lord, we've experienced so many good things in the Lord, we, we feel we don't deserve any more. That we have so many things that God has done that, man, we, we've almost brought our, our limit. We only get 100 things in life, and I've already got to 99, so you know, I've got to be very careful. I, I might only need one more aspect of grace. Now, it, it, I think I really believe it's unlimited. Grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy. God tells us to just unabandonedly come with unfettered speech, boldness, confidence to the throne of grace that we would receive. Mercy. God loves to give mercy. He loves to give grace. He loves to minister to your life. He loves to solve the problem. He takes you out of the bondage to bring you to the promised land, my friend. Don't let any lie stop you or those that you're ministering to. Hey, this is Russ, Session 2. We'll look forward to seeing you in Session 3. God bless you, my friends. The Lord be with you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him that you might overflow with this hope. 